Amen. I want you to turn in your Bible with me here this morning to Revelation chapter 21. And we're going to read one verse, verse 14 here this morning. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 14. And this is a message that's been weighing upon my heart. I want to minister unto you. It's got an unusual title, an unusual subject, but a very serious message, a very important one, one that can affect your life here this morning, depending on what you do with this, could affect your eternity. It's of such reality and power and importance. But reading from Revelation chapter 21, this is the fifth part, part five of our series, Searching for a City with Foundation. And we've been looking in the previous four messages about those, the righteous, the justified, who are searching for a city, an eternal city, a city that will know no end, that's going to outlast this world. It's not of this world. It's not physical. It is eternal. It's going to be here when this old world of ours perishes. And in Revelation 21, we have a vision, teaching, instruction about that city in detail. My message here this morning, part five, the missing name. Revelation 21, verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Let's pray together. Father, we bow our heads and hearts to you before you here this morning. Lord God, we acknowledge your power and your presence and your sovereignty. Lord God, we acknowledge your goodness and your mercy and your grace, your kindness towards us, O God, your long suffering, your endurance, O God, your bearing long with us. My God, thank God for the mercy of God, that it's your character and nature to show us mercy, O God, nor God to hold back what we deserve to be very patient and enduring with us. Lord God, we thank you that you're a good God and a kind God and a loving God and a merciful God. You're a God of grace who gives us what we do not deserve. And you're a God of mercy that withholds what we do deserve. And Lord God, we bow before you and acknowledge you this morning. And even as we deal with this message, the missing name, as we look at the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, the very city that the righteous of God are going to dwell in for all eternity. Lord God, I pray, O oh God, that there wouldn't be one in this gathering whose name would not be mentioned in that city. Nor God, will you make us to tremble at the thought of being so close to the gospel, of hearing the word of God, of being around Christians, of hearing the gospel time without numbers, of seeing changed lives, O oh God, and yet not experiencing the power, the forgiveness, the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Lord God, we ask of you, wash us in the blood of the Lamb. Make us clean, O oh God. Make us white in the precious blood. Make us to know what it is to be forgiven by Jesus and to have a personal relationship with him. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. My message here, The Missing Name. It's a strange title, The Missing Name. Imagine something of great importance. And you expect your name to be there. You know your name's going to be there. But you turn up and your name's not on the list. Imagine dressing up, preparing, traveling to a wedding. And you get to the door and your name's not on the list. That's nothing. I'm talking about something of great 
worth here, something far more important. You can't imagine the importance of having your name written in certain places. You can afford for it not to be written down here, but you can't afford for it not to be written in heaven. The verse that we have just read here, verse 14, talking about the new Jerusalem in the new heaven and earth. Listen to the, what it says about the city. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them, in the foundations, engraven on those foundations are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 12 apostles of the Lamb. The names of 12 men were written on those 12 foundations. As we've looked at in the previous messages, each of these 12 foundations that uphold the city, the new Jerusalem, the city where God dwells with his people for all eternity, these are men's names on the foundation. They are apostles of Jesus Christ. We know about the 12 apostles. Their names are written on these stones. They're engraved upon them. God himself engraves a man's name like Peter and John and Matthew. Their names are written on these 12 stones. But yet if you know what the Bible teaches, there's one of the 12 apostles, one of the 12 disciples, one of the 12 men listed and named in our Bibles. He doesn't make it. Do you know what? I believe his name is not written on the 12th stone. His name could have been there. His name should have been there. His name might have been there. His name came close to being there. But his name is not written on that 12th ginormous stone. It's an eternal stone. The engraving, the name written on it is eternal but there's a name missing. And that name, and you know it very well, is Judas, Iscariot, son of Simon. It says in Proverbs 22 verse 1, and this is the wisdom of God's Bible, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. The Bible teaches, if you've got a choice, between great riches, masses of riches, and just having a good name, a good reputation, a name that is well spoken about, you better choose the good name. The Bible says that. And loving favor, you ought to love favor rather than silver and gold. You better love favor. This isn't the way how the world thinks or carnal so-called Christians think. They don't think like this. I worry about a person in the church who doesn't think like this. Then listen to what it says in Ecclesiastes 7 and 1. A good name is better than precious ointment. Do you know there's something about precious ointment? It has a very, very good smell. If it's good ointment, it's got a long-lasting smell. My deodorant dissipates after a few moments. It's cheap stuff. That's why. But if you're willing to pay enough and search enough, if you want that special ointment, that smell will linger. It, you can walk into a room and it can actually be smelt in the room. That fragrance comes into the room. So the Bible says a good name is better than precious ointment, far better. You know why? It has a certain smell of fragrance. If someone walks into a room with a very beautiful fragrance, everybody no notices it. Everybody likes it. It leaves an impact. It leaves a mark. Everyone is conscious of that smell. And the reverse is also uh, the 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 truth as well. A good name. A good name is worth more than great riches. 
what your name tells about you. As soon as someone mentions your name or I think of your name and what I think of you says an awful lot about you. Your name actually reveals something. The mention of your name stirs up thoughts and feelings and memories, awarenesses. You either go, you know, if you look out the curtain, go, such and such has just arrived. Oh, no. Or, oh, praise God. Quick, usher them in. Close the curtains. Let's hide. You see, a name, a reputation has an effect. Some years ago, a church, a small church, very kindly took up an offering for me, unasked for, unsought for. They took up a gathering. They sacrificed. They gathered 2,000 pounds in the north of Ireland. And they decided to buy me a car, which I greatly needed because my exhausts were always falling off. I, I was noted or oil leaks or something else. Well, they bought me a car, and before I got it, the pastor stood excitedly saying, we've got you a car, and we got it from such and such a Christian man who has a car dealership. My entire heart sank into the soles of my feet. I couldn't tell them. I didn't utter it. I didn't tell them what I thought. But you know what was going through my mind? If there's one car salesman in all of Northern Ireland I would not go to, he is the one. I don't know about cars. I don't know about buying and selling. I don't know about garages. All I know is in the entire nation, there's only one man I wouldn't buy a car off, and he is that man. In the entire world, I'm not joking, his reputation, my heart sank. My entire heart went down. I went, oh, no. But I said, let's hope for the best. I got that car. I had it seven weeks. We were on School of Christ delivering students back to Shannon Airport just down this road who had to get there in time for their flight. And I'm halfway between Limerick and Shannon Airport. And all of a sudden, my entire engine cracks open. I don't know what's happening. And I end up at the side, all of a sudden there's a fire engine on the motorway. And I go, what are they doing? No, it's for me. All the oil is in, across the entire carriageway. And my heart sank and I went, I, I'm telling you, a name and a reputation means something. Never, ever buy a car from a so-called Christian car salesman like that. Never, ever. If you want to know who he is, just come to me afterwards and I'll tell you, don't buy a car there. See, reputation means something. When your name's mentioned, something comes to mind. But my opinion's very little, very light. It's not important. But see what God thinks of your name. It's very important. I've got three points here that I want to deal with concerning this verse and the teaching of Scripture. Number one, a notable name. Number two, a notorious name. And then number three, a non-existent name. Number one, a notable name. I'm going to deal with Judas here. His name should have been on one of those stones, one of those 12 stones, eternal stones, ginormous stones, precious stones in the very city of God. But it's missing. This is the first thing I want you to see is a notable name. Judas actually had a notable name. When he was born as a little baby boy, he was given a notable name. The name Judas is not a bad name. It's a good name. It's the same as Judah in the Old Testament. It means praise, to praise God, to make much of God. His parents must have had high ideals, influenced by the word of God. They come out of the tribe of Judah. That means to praise the Lord. That tribe led the way. It was a leadership tribe. 
It led the way in following after God and walking in the ways of God. That's what the tribe was. He was born into a tribe very near Jerusalem, the city of God. What a thing to have a name like Judah or Judas. It wasn't a bad thing. It was a very, very good thing. When you come into the New Testament and you begin to read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, you begin to read lists of 12 men that were chosen by Christ to be with him. A list of 12 names. There are four lists of the 12 apostles. You find them in Matthew 10, Mark chapter 3. Luke chapter 6, and then you get a fourth list of 12 names in Acts chapter 1. As you read these lists, Peter, you know Simon Peter, Peter is always first in all four lists. He is always first. The order sometimes differ in these lists, but if you look at every fifth person, or the first person, the fifth person, and then whatever other person, they are always the leader of the pack. There's three groups of four, and you have a leader, the same leader of those particular band of four men. It's laid out in that way. So you have these four lists that keep going like that. There's three groups of four. When you begin to look at these names, there's two sets of brothers within the apostolic band. There's also another man called Judas. So there's two Judases, but they're always distinguished. Iscariot is always different from the other one. But I want you to notice in the first three lists, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Judas is always mentioned last. He always comes last in the list. He always comes 12th in the list, but he is mentioned there. This band of men, unique men, unusual men, he's got his name on the list. Twelve men. Do you know what? The apostles of the Lamb only remain twelve. They've never gone to thirteen. There's never been a thirteenth or a fourteenth apostle of the Lamb. Now, there are other apostles that come after the resurrection, which are given to the church of Jesus by Jesus himself. But these apostles of the Lamb are utterly unique. There's only 12 apostles of the Lamb. They never can increase. In Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, the 12 are referred to nine times. In other words, they're not primarily called apostles. They're called the 12. The 12. One of the 12. That's how they're known. So this number, the 12, it's only ever been the 12. It was only meant to be 12. It's never going to change from 12. And that's why there's 12 names on the 12 foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. Out of those, <coughs> Judas is one of the 12 in Matthew's. Once they're actually men named as 12 apostles. Sometimes they're called the 12 disciples. Now, what are apostles and disciples? Apostle is a ministry. Christ chose these men to be his greatest ministries. When he's going to build a church, what does he do? He chooses 12 men. When he's going to build a church, what does he do? He pours all of his time, all of his teaching, all of his personal contact into only 12 men. You're going to build a worldwide church. You're going to die, be buried, raise again, go back to heaven. What are you going to do? You're going to invest everything in only 12 men. Not a hundred, not a thousand, not 10,000. You're primarily putting leadership in 12 unique, unusual men. And you know what? Christ chose these men to be apostles. The name apostle means a sent one, an ambassador, a representative, one with authority, one who, who lays foundations, one who has authority to train up leaders, to establish churches, 
to change the very foundation of things. This is what apostles are, to go into new areas, to raise up the church for the very first time. Only 12 men were chosen like this, but they're also disciples. Notice they're called the 12 disciples, the 12 disciples. The word disciple means a taught one or a learner. Notice these 12, they're uniquely called the 12 taught ones, learners. They're with Christ being taught. They're his personal disciples to embody all that he teaches. They're meant to be marked with his message and then carry his message and then communicate his message. These 12 men are utterly unique and Judas is among them. That's why I say he's got a notable name, not only by his birth, but by his reputation. Imagine being named, chosen, called to be one of the unique 12. One of only 12 that are going to be with Christ in a special way and one day have your name on the eternal city of God where all the people of God dwell. Imagine having your name on such a list. It's remarkable. In Mark, the 12 are referred to 10 times, always as the 12, never as the apostles or disciples. In Luke, the 12 are referred to nine times, Usually as the 12, but with, as apostles as well. Then in John, four times the 12 are mentioned. This term, the 12, is repeated time after time after time. It is more important than saying the apostles. They don't just say the apostles. They always say the 12 and then define them. They are apostles. They are disciples. They are with Christ. They do follow Christ. And notice what it says here in Revelation 21 and verse 14. It calls them the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he's called the Lamb. They're 12 apostles of the Lamb. You know what it means when John the Baptist pointed, Jesus said, behold the Lamb of God. It meant he's the one prophesied for thousands of years. One is going to come who's going to shed his blood. One is going to die like a lamb for the sins of the entire world. His name was Jesus. These men were chosen to be the ambassadors of the Lamb of God. He's innocent. He's meek. He's harmless. He's sinless. He's perfect. He's a chosen lamb. He's a sacrificial lamb. He willingly dies. He lays his life down for sinners. That's who the Lamb of God is. And look, this Lamb that's going to die for the sins of all the world, in all of time, in every generation, he's a meek Lamb. He's God's Lamb. Do you know what? He only chose 12 apostles. I want you to notice some things about Judas. This man with a notable name. Everybody knew his name in that hour. Everybody in the early church knew who he was. Tens of thousands. Imagine having meetings. Tens of thousands. Everyone knew Judas. He's one of the healers. He's one of those that cast out demons. He's one of those that associate with Jesus Christ. They have mega meetings of 10,000 people. They they feed the hungry. 5,000 at a time. Give me these loaves of bread and a few fishes and I'll feed thousands. Guess who's one of them handing this out? The bread out. The fish out. Who's seeing it? Who saw Peter walk on the water to Jesus? Remember Jesus came walking. Who saw that? Judas had a front row seat. He saw the dead raised, the lepers healed, the great gatherings, a nation impacted. You know who's identified with this great revival preacher, this evangelist from Galilee? Judas. Everyone recognized you're one of his apostles. You're one of his preachers. You're one of his healers. I actually believe power was given to Judas to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to save the lost, to open prison doors. 
Remember, Jesus said, I give you power to all of them. Didn't say to you, 11, not to you. What a remarkable name. Do you know what? When you study this name, Judas, you, you see a notable position, not only a notable name, a notable position. He was chosen to be an apostle after Jesus prayed all night. Christ spent one entire night praying in order to choose 12 men. He didn't sleep that night. Judas was the name he chose. You are going to be one of my 12 apostles. Your name's chosen by Christ himself to be an apostle. A notable name, a notable position, a notable association. One of the prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus, it said about the Messiah, the coming Messiah, it says this, Psalm 41 verse 9, Yea, my own familiar friend, speaking about Judas, the one who's going to betray him, lift up his heel against him, hate him. But listen to what it says first, my familiar friend. Do you realize Judas had an association with Christ? He was a familiar friend. Imagine eating together, traveling together, speaking together, sleeping side by side, sharing your food, your money, your coat. You're a familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread. Or what about Psalm 55, 13? But it was thou, a man, mine equal, my guide, mine acquaintance. Do you know certain times Judas guided Jesus to a certain spot? He was an acquaintance. He was familiar. So here's Judas. He's got a notable association with Jesus. Not everyone could travel with them. Do you realize thousands wanted to travel with Jesus? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be, he comes through your little village town. Please let me travel with you. You can't have thousands of people travel around like that. You just can't do that. Judas had an unusual association and closeness and insight and constant communion with Jesus. He watched him from morning to night. Notice as well. A notable movement. Judas was part of a notable movement. This was a radical, revolutionary, religious movement that still has not come to an end. It changed our world. Judas was at the beginning of a revolution, a spiritual revolution from heaven. He was right at the heart of it. Can you imagine being part of a movement that impacts an entire nation, an entire generation? No, an entire world. Can you imagine being that close to Jesus, the preacher, the prophet, the sent one, the Messiah? Can you imagine that? A notable recorded history. Judas has a name noted, written into one of the most remarkable recorded histories in all of the world, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Judas is there written amongst the foremost list of names in all of history, chosen for it. Do you realize how remarkable what I'm saying? And then what about a notable promise that we have? Remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 and speaking to the 12 and Peter says, we've forsaken all. What about us? We've forsaken home. We've left our town, our villages, our family, our jobs, our fishing nets, our money, all of our savings. What about us? Jesus says, don't you worry. I'm going to take care of you. Do you know one of the things he says to Peter at that time? He says, ye also shall sit, turn to the 12, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Imagine this small, rough bunch of men, Galilean fishermen, Judas, 
And Jesus said, do you realize the tribes of Israel, all 12 tribes from every generation for over a thousand years and into the future, you are going to sit on 12 unique thrones and you're going to be judging these entire tribes of Israel that you come out of. You're an ignorant fisherman, but you're going to sit and judge princes and judge kings all through the generations. So we have a notable promise. Judas is there with a promise. You 12 are going to have a unique position. Do you see why I say that Judas had a notable name? A notable name. Second of all, He had a notorious name. You know that. A notorious name. Do you know the word notorious? It means to be known very widely for something very bad. We use the word infamous. To be famous is a good thing. To be infamous is to be famous for the wrong thing. Infamy. Badness. Saints of God, can I ask you, do you have a notable name? Do you have a notorious name? Doesn't matter what I think about you, what about God? You see, Judas had not only a notable name, an unusually notable name, a highly notable name, a favored name, a preferred name, a chosen name. All these things. And it wasn't just man. This is God. God dealing towards him. You know what? God gave Judas the greatest of opportunities. But second, a notorious name. When we go into the Gospels, we read concerning Judas. He was one of the 12. That's what's often written there. Judas, one of the 12. So he is one of the 12. We also read Judas Iscariot to identify him so we don't mix him up with other Judases. Nothing wrong with the name Judas. Then he's also called the son of Simon. So you know who he is. So whether he's called one of the 12, Iscariot, or the son of Simon, It's just to identify him. But he has another name. You know it very well, don't you? There's another way to identify him. Not just as one of the 12. Not just as Iscariot. Because you know what Iscariot means? It actually means S or Ish. It means man of. The man of Kerioth. This is a place mentioned briefly in Joshua 15, 25. It's just south of Jerusalem. It's in Judea, just a short distance from Jerusalem. When we read Iscariot, it's actually identifying the town he is from or the area he is from or the region he is from. So his name, Judas Iscariot, is identifying who he is, his culture, his accent, his family, all of this is being recognized by it. His name, Judas, was recognized by another way. The word betrayer was added to it. Listen carefully to this. Matthew 27, verse 3. Judas, which had betrayed him, Imagine now, not only that you have a notable name, but you've got a notorious name. Do you see how Judas, he didn't have that at the beginning? Not for many years. He sat under the preaching of Christ three years before betrayer is attached to his name. Three years. He was called the preacher, the apostle, the disciple. He was identified by his town, his father. He was identified as a follower of Jesus. But all through those years, never as a betrayer. But you know what the Bible says? He had a notorious name. 
It says also in Mark 3, 19, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. Luke 22, 48, but Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Or in John 12, 4, and Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. What a description, but it doesn't finish there. Which should betray him. Imagine that becoming the defining thing of who you are. Oh, I might not know you're called from Iscariot. I might not know that you're from Karath. I may not know your dad's name is Simon. I may not know that. But you know what? Imagine if I knew, oh, you mean Judas who betrayed Jesus? This become the most defining mark of Judas's life. He had a notorious name. Go out there in the world. There's people who don't even know who Jesus is. They know who Judas is. Tell me something about Jesus. Oh, I'm not sure. Do you know who Judas is? Oh, he betrayed. Betrayed who? You almost know him better than Jesus. That's where our world's come to. Everyone knows a Judas. You're a Judas. Every betrayer all through history, right down to today, is called a Judas. If I call you a Judas, it's worse than calling you a pig. Far worse. See this word, betrayal, means to hand over, sell out, have done with, give over. This is a man who used to be a friend, a close acquaintance, someone very intimate. It means to yield up, to transmit him over, to surrender him. Would you want friends in a hard day? The soldiers come looking for the Christian. He's one. (laughs) Have him. Thanks, buddy. Don't we despise betrayers? You do everything for them. You're there for them. You help them. You feed them. You clothe them. You encourage them. And when it really is important that they stand for you, they sell you out. They forsake you. They run. They lock the door on you. Leave you outside. You see, betrayal is a terrible thing. You know what Jesus said about the last days? What's going to come through the church is a spirit of betrayal. Brother is going to betray brother. It's one of the classic marks of the last days within the church. It's going to happen. It's going to be an entire movement, a noticeable movement across the church. And so you have this man, he is known, he has a notorious name, Judas. Oh, you mean a betrayer? Not just a betrayer, you betrayed Jesus. He wasn't just a nice guy like me. Jesus was perfect, sinless. He loved. Saints, we don't even come close to the Lamb of God. He loves you. He's kind. He's good. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. He is bountiful. He's overwhelming. I haven't even begun. I don't even come close. He betrayed the greatest man that ever lived. A sinless man. No man was treated better than Judas. Never in world history. Never. Imagine being treated better than anyone in all of history and you betray that. Imagine God's son who done everything right. You know, there's some people, it doesn't matter what you do, right? Those, they'll see the cobweb in your living room. You've, you've cleaned all day long. They'll come in and see that one cobweb. Talk, walk out and talk about it. There's some people you can never please them. But you're dealing with God's son that's perfect, that's sinless. And you have a Judas dealing with him. Not even Christ could satisfy Judas. Listen to me. There's people in the church 
not even Judas, or sorry, not even Jesus is perfect enough for them. You won't meet their standards, no matter what you do. Notice Judas's notorious name. He didn't always have it. He was given it. Do you know why he was given the name betrayer? Because he was known by his actions, by a decision or multiple decisions, by events that he was caught up with, people he got embroiled with. Not Judas, but betrayer. It's not the name Judas that was bad. There's nothing wrong with the name Judas. It's a beautiful name. But do you know what the issue is? It's the reputation associated with that name because of the actions. You've now got a notorious name because of your decisions, your attitudes, your actions. You may not be a Judas, but you could be sitting here. Your carelessness about God, your casualness, your ignorance, your lethargy, your apathy, your indifference. You're marking out your reputation before God. Your sin, your love of sin. You need to be so, so careful. See Judas behind his actions to betray Jesus, to kiss him, sell him for 30 bits of silver, to identify him with a kiss to his enemies, lead his enemies right to him where he is. But you know what? Behind the traitor was the tempter. Oh yeah, Judas was absolutely responsible, absolutely, for every action, every thought. But you know who came in behind that in order to push him over the edge? Because who would betray the master? See, I look at the church, I look at the world, I see sinners I see professing Christians do things, make decisions. It's not natural. I mean, who would do those things in the church? Who would be a preacher and lie? Who would dare do that? Who would be a pastor in a church and manipulate and abuse people in the church? Who would do that? Who could do that? Do you think you're just looking at a man? See, some men... And I said it the other night, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay. You need to be aware of sin. You can't play with sin. Remember what the Proverbs say, can a man take fire in his bosom and not burn himself? You know what it's talking about? Guys playing around with wee girls. You don't want to do that. That'll take you a long way. You see, behind Judas is he had sin, he had thoughts, he had decisions, actions. There came one who he wasn't aware of. See, when you're preoccupied by yourself, your own ambitions, your own thoughts, your own dreams, you're not even aware who's coming in on that. And it's very dangerous. Because you won't be aware of him. You won't see him. You can't see him. See, Judas... Listen to what it said in John chapter 6, verse 70. Have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Imagine saying that to your disciples. But there's only 12 of us. I've chosen you 12. He limited the number. One of you is a devil. One of you It's going to betray me. But woe to that man who betrays me. It'd be better you'd never been born. You don't want to be alive if you ever do this to Christ. Then says in John chapter 13 and 2, supper being ended, this is the last supper. The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Do you see that? Judas was already playing with this, planning this, 
Maybe he was only tinkering with it, only thinking about it, but not serious. Maybe he was just dallying with the offer. You betray him, we'll give you 30 bits of silver. Just let it roll. I'm not seriously entertaining. I'm just thinking on it. Just talking with them. Just looking. Just considering. And it says at that table, the devil put into the heart. He'd already been playing with it, already been talking about it, already been thinking about it, already planning it. But now the devil put into his heart to do it. Do you know there's some things you would never do if the devil doesn't come in on the back of it? You wouldn't do. You'd have to be out of your mind to do. But do you know what? You'll tinker with it. You'll circuit it. You'll play with it. You'll consider it. Oh, but I'm in control here. No, you're taking fire in your bosom. And I'll burn you so badly, you can't even imagine. Do you know what it says? And this Jesus speaking... The devil having now put into his heart. The word put means to fire like an arrow. Imagine betrayal. The act of betrayal that he's going to become famous for. For all eternity. All time. Even the world knows the act of betrayal. Do you realize the devil... Fire the fiery art. There is satanic power, feeling, movement to drive you over the edge to do what you wouldn't naturally do. Some people just sin in their minds and hearts go, but I'd never do it. Do you know here what you see? You see Satan himself firing the dart, putting it right in. And you know what? There's no protection. Jesus said, about this one who is the devil. He said, and I know who of you 12 hasn't believed from the beginning. One of you is a devil and you did not believe. They weren't converted. Here's Judas. He's got no protection for the arrow. This is a powerful being called Lucifer who was there in the garden, there with Eve, there with King David, provoking him to number the people of Israel. Just number them. Oh, but God's word says don't. Just number them. See how many folk you have. The devil provoked David. Do you think you can withstand in your own power? I don't. I don't think I can. I need a shield of faith. I need the gift of faith. You know, Judas had no protection for that fiery dart. He could have had. And so it was in his heart, the betrayal. So what does Jesus do now? What's what's the next in the choreograph? What do you think Christ is going to do? Goes and gets a bucket of water, takes off his garment, and he kneels down. And he washes the feet of the twelve, including Judas. This notorious man with betrayal in his heart. That's what Christ done, washed his feet. He said, I do this as an example for you. Then as they sat at the table, John chapter 13, 27, inquisitive Peter, he wants to know, Because Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. One of you sitting at this table, there is only 12. One of you is going to betray me. Everyone's scared to ask. Not publicly, but Peter's got to know. Remember what they all said? Said, Master, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? So I believe if you were there, you would have said, is it me? I would have said. God, I don't trust my own heart. I don't trust myself. I'm scared of my own self. God, don't leave me to my own thoughts and devices. I have no confidence in my own self. Have mercy. Is that betrayal in me? Could I do that? Then Judas says, 
Oh, is it me? I mean, after all, when 11 said, you better say it. Oh, is it me? You know. You know. He knew it was him. See, you could say that and you don't mean it. You know it exactly, it's you. But the 11 were terrified at the thought. Do you know, I've met three people, Christians over the years, who thought they were Judas. Three actual Christians. You know what? They were worried because of their weakness and their frailty or some sin they'd committed. And they went, maybe I'm Judas. They were in tears. They were anxious. They were scared. They're wrestling. They're begging for an answer. And I couldn't persuade them. And I almost laughed and said, you are not Judas. You're not Judas. Do you want to be Judas? No. Are you scared of it? Yes. Do you want to know you're forgiven? Yes. You're not Judas. You're not Judas. Oh, this man's cold, cool, calculated. You know what it says in John 13, 27? As they all went round and said that, then Peter says to John, John's closer. So at the table, you've got Peter, you've got John, you've got Jesus. And John is leaning on the bosom of Jesus. Do you know why Jesus let him lean on him? Do you know why it wasn't the other 11? Because he wanted to. Don't get all theological on me. Just keep it simple. And he was the youngest. But he wanted to. He just reclined on Jesus. Some of you don't get it because you don't want it or don't go for it. You grumble about it. You know. Just go. Lean on him. Don't grumble. Why does he get so cl close to the master? Maybe because he leans back. Peter leans in, speaks to him, and he whispers. You don't read this in the text. See, everyone thinks Peter just blurted out, so who is it then? And he tells John, ask him. Why would he, if he's speaking out audibly, why would he say, John, you ask Jesus? Why would he? He didn't. He asked John, ask the master who it is. He whispered it. No one else at the table heard. Peter Whispers to John, John, who is it? Ask him. I just know he's going to answer you. That's why I get so annoyed with you, John. If anyone's going to find out, he'll tell you. He's mad at John. That's going to get sorted. And then John turns to Jesus and goes, Master, who is it? And then Jesus speaks to him and says, The one who dips the sop with me in the dish. That's him. Do you realize only one person at the table got a marker to indicate who's going to betray him? Who's the betrayer? Who the devil's going to use? Who's a child of the devil? Oh, I could discern them. I can discern anyone. I can see who anyone is. I can see through you. No, you wouldn't have seen through Judas. You wouldn't have. You would have thought he's a great guy and a spiritual guy and a thoughtful guy and a moral guy and a kind guy. You'd be so wrong. Do you know what it says? Verse 13, chapter 13, 27. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. As soon as he dipped it in there, Satan, no longer an arrow being fired, Satan enters into Judas. The betrayer, now your fate is sealed. You're in a collision course with hell. This is demon possession. This is the devil entering into a man to make him commit a crime that in no way you'd have to be crazy to do. But the devil's going to make you do it. He'll drive you to destruction. Then Jesus said unto him, was he speaking to Judas or the devil? That thou doest, do quickly. And he went out into the darkness of night. You remember back in the garden then, when after they've had the time of prayer in Gethsemane, and then here come the soldiers, late at night. Who's leading them? Judas, the friend. 
the apostle, the disciple, the man who cares about the poor. Remember him? The man who carries the money bag. The familiar friend of Jesus. The one who casts demons out and who preaches and who heals the sick. Yeah, that's him. Here he comes into the garden. Late at night in darkness. The soldiers have their burning fire to see where they're going. You know what Judas done? He betrayed him with a kiss. You know what Jesus called him? Friend. Friend. Do you know in the past, some measly folk in the church that were really doing me dirt and I called them friend. Didn't know what I was doing. I knew what was happening. And when it's an act of betrayal, and I said, friend, I've always treated you as a friend. And even now I do. You can do what you're going to do to me. But I'll treat you and act you as a friend. I'll love you. Even amidst betrayal. This wasn't some sporadic crisis driven to this. No, this was a cool, calculated, well thought out act. An act of sin. It, it came out of his own heart and mind. It was planned. Other people come in on it. Do you know what he's looking for? Just a bit of ground. 30 bits of silver. When you go over to Acts chapter 1, you find what his thinking was. With the 30 bits of silver, with the money, it's called the reward of iniquity to purchase a field. Or listen this, what it says in Acts chapter 1. It talks about the habitation be desolate. In other words, it was a little cottage, a little house, a little bit of land. What was Judas after? A little pension, a bit of retirement. This movement's going screw F. We're all going to get killed here. I just want a bit of land. I'm thinking of myself. I'm thinking of my future. I'm thinking of my finance, my house, my welfare. Yeah, and you'd betray Christ for that. Some people betray him for a job or a girl or a guy. Or a house. It's amazing what I've seen people betray Christ for. Oh, it's not 30 bits of silver. No, it's something. Eve done it for a bit of knowledge. I want to be like God. Okay, here you go. Remember the guy who took the Babylonish garment, brought the whole nation to a standstill? You, why did you damn yourself for a few bits of silver in a Babylonian garment. You see, he had a notorious name. Do you know there's only two men in the Bible called the son of perdition? It means the son of destruction. The son of damnation, the son of hell. Only two men. One is the Antichrist and the other is Judas. Imagine being called a child of damnation. Imagine being identified with the coming Antichrist. You know why? Because the devil is going to enter into a man, a political man, a brilliant man, and he's going to sell his soul to the devil. You may say, well, the devil pounced on him. No, he did not. You know, this man, it says in Matthew 26, and from that time, he, Judas, sought opportunity to betray him. He saw it. He was looking. He was thinking. Kept thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I going to bring this about? In Mark chapter 14, and it says, and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. He's thinking. He's sitting at home. He's walking down the road thinking, how am I going to do this? You're going to regret the day you ever thought that. All of us have sinful thoughts. All of us have to fight the devil. All of us have failed along the way. But I'm talking about something brewing so deeply you can't imagine. See, he knew the place. He knew the time. He knew the persons. He knew the hour. He knew who, who would be there. It says in Luke 22 and 6, he sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. He's a coward. he done it at night when there's no one around, only the twelve. I'll betray him. How did he do it? With a kiss on the cheek. The mark, the symbol of friendship. The man who's just washed your feet, you're going to sell him 
for a kiss. You remember who this man was? He was the one that carried the bag. And the Bible actually says he took from the bag. Remember the lady who poured the ointment on Jesus' feet? And then Judas speaks up and says, hold on, master, why wasn't this given? Why wasn't it sold for a hundred pence? That's a year's worth of money. Why wasn't it sold for a hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but, but, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and he bare what was put therein. Cunning man. Here's a movement in the church. We care about the poor. No, you don't. Judas was a professional. He was a hypocrite. He was a game player. He, he deceived everyone. Only little John knew who he was going to betray. He didn't tell Peter, by the way. He didn't tell him. Peter was scared of his task. Maybe Peter was sitting going, why hasn't John come back and told me? Maybe it's me. Maybe you're scared to ask. John, who, who said? You! You're the man! Maybe he was scared. You, you identify with these disciples far too much, you know. Far too much. Do you know what happened? And I don't have time to go into this. He betrayed Christ. The devil leaves him. Because the devil always does that. He leaves you high, high and dry. Commit the act and he'll leave you. And you go, why did I do this? What have I done? And the Bible says he sought repentance with tears. He tried to find it and couldn't find it. And then he tried to give the money back to the priest and said, I don't want it. I didn't mean to do it. Too late. See how the devil will take you further. He'll take you so far and destroy you. And then Judas went out and hung himself and he couldn't even do that right. He messed up his own hanging. He made a pig's ear of it. And we're not going there. But do you know what happened in Acts chapter 1? We're told that two Men says we're numbered to be chosen out to take Judas's place. And one of them called Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. It wasn't Paul the apostle, it was Matthias was chosen. Who is he? You don't know in the bottom. You can't tell me anything about Matthias. You haven't got a clue, but I'll tell you what his name is on one of the 12 foundation stones. His name is there eternally engraved on it. Can you imagine slipping in? Let no man steal your crown. Some of you here have a crown you're going to gain. But I tell you, if you go AWOL, someone else will pick up your crown. I believe there's people in this room there's, there's a girl for you to marry, a man for you to marry, a ministry for you to fulfill, the will of God to do, some soul to reach. If you don't do it, hey, God isn't going to sit down and cry over you. He'll go choose another. You're going to find if your name isn't on that stone, someone else's name will be in your place. We're not going to sit around here crying about you. This train is moving on down the track. And I'm not being callous. There's lots of love here. But you know what? No one, if you want sin, if you, hate, if you hate the things of God, you're going to find out you miss out on an awful lot. Let me finish. Third and finally, a non-existent name. A non-existent name. Go look at those 12 foundation stones with 12 names of the apostles of the Lamb. Matthias is there. He's on that 12th stone. Judas isn't there. Judas could have been there, should have been there, might have been there. He's not there. He's not there. This is why I call this message the missing name. I'm talking about the New Jerusalem, a missing name. Oh, there could only be 12 stones. There was only one Judas 
with a name missing on a stone. But listen to what it says in that same chapter. After we're told about this city with the 12 foundations, listen carefully. Revelation 21, 27. And there in sh shall in no wise enter into this city, the new Jerusalem, with the 12 foundations. There will enter into it in no wise anything that defileth. You could get in the church, but you won't get in that city. You could get in the pulpit, but you won't get in that city. Nothing that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. We're told that everyone in the New Jerusalem has their name written in a book. It's a unique book. It's called the Lamb's book of life. Only those redeemed by the Lamb are written in that book. And believe me, most names are missing from it. It is a remarkable book. And names are written there. It says before this in Revelation, in chapter 13, verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth, this is going to happen very shortly, all that dwell upon the earth worship him, Antichrist, the son of perdition, the coming Judas. All that dwell on the earth are going to worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We are on the edge of something happening in our world that's not natural, and we've never seen it in world history, and we're very close. When Antichrist appears and his mark and technology merges with man, everyone whose name is not written in the book of La Lamb's book of life, is going to worship him. He won't have power. Oh, I'd resist him. I'd say no. I'd run. I'd hide. No, you'd be like Judas. You will betray. This is a supernatural power. And then it says in Revelation 20, verse 12, and I saw the dead. This is at the end of age, at the age, small and great, Stand before God. And the books were open. Various books. And the judgment. Various books are going to be opened. And another book was opened. Which is the book of life. And the dead were judged. Out of those things which were written in the books. According to their works. And what you've done like Judas. Betrayer. Not only a notable name, a notorious name. But listen, a non-existent name. What does the Bible say in Revelation 3 and 5? He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white. If you overcome, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. What is the book of life? How is it different than the Lamb's book of life? The book of life, every town, every city in the Roman Empire, in the Greek world and the Roman world, they all had a book. That town, that city, that community, that village had a book. It's called the book of life. When you're born as a child, your name's written in there. When you die of old age or injury or murder, your name's struck out. You no longer exist in this community. Oh yes, there's a record of you, your birth, your death, and they struck you out. That's the mark. You're dead, you're gone, you're not here anymore. That's what the book of life is. Do you know certain men are getting struck out of the book of life? When you reach the end of your days, or you're cut off in a car accident or something else, or die of a heart attack, and you don't know Christ, you're struck out of God's book. A line goes through. That's the book of life. But there's a different book, the book, the Lamb's book of life. It doesn't have the mark of your birth and your death and your lack of repentance. Do you know what it has? Your name's written there from the foundations of the world. 
everyone redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from Adam and Abel, all written there, all their names. And you know what? It's only those that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to be in the New Jerusalem. Judas' name wasn't on the stone, but that's not the worst part of it. His name was missing on the stone. That is in the crisis. Not only was his name missing from the 12th stone, his name was missing from the book of life. And worse still, his name was missing from the Lamb's book of life, the book of blood redemption. He had apostleship. He had discipleship. He had familiarity, association with Jesus. He was chosen for ministry. But you know what? He died without forgiveness and the cleansing of the blood. You know what it says in Acts 1? Judas died that he might go to his own place. He was a son of perdition, of hell. See, if you don't make heaven, where are you going? You go to hell. It's no purgatory. No third option. You don't stop existing. You've got two options, heaven or hell. And either your name is written down the Lamb's Book of Life, or it's expunged by God himself. You're condemned, rejected, removed, forgotten. You get resurrected on Judgment Day to stand before God. And he says, why didn't you believe? Why didn't you accept me? Why didn't you come? Oh, but I didn't have an opportunity. Yes, you did. Oh, but I didn't know. Yes, you did. Oh, but no one told me. Yes, they did. Oh, but I didn't have time. Yes, you did. Oh, but I was too busy. No, you weren't. Only one life. It will soon be over. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's all. Nothing else. And friends, what you do with Christ, what you do with your decisions and choices and actions and directions in life is going to set you for all eternity in a certain direction, either heaven or hell. Please stand with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we need you today. Let's pray. Let's just call on him. Let's ask him to search our hearts. We need the moving of the Holy Spirit of God today. We need the real Holy Spirit to move in hearts and lives. We could be standing on the edge of eternity here. I've seen enough in life to realize that. Lord God, I'm asking of you that your sweet wind, the wind of your Holy Spirit of regeneration would blow across this gathering as we've dealt with this new Jerusalem, this city of God, these 12 foundations. Lord God, we stand in awe. Lord God, of the name that should have been written on one of these mighty stones eternally and yet the name is missing it's not there it's not found it's been expunged from the book of life nor god this man that was so close was yet so far this man kissed the gateway to heaven and yet died and went to hell suddenly this man that had all the benefits all the blessings all the opportunities he shunned it he rejected it he played with sin he allowed the devil to get inside his mind and then his heart and then his body. My God, we're asking of you. Lord God, have mercy upon us in this room. Lord God, will you draw near right now? Will you have a dealing with life in the mighty name of Jesus?